And together, this comprises space law, and it is the basic and the ground for uh, conducting also the orderly use of outer space. Now, when we look at the first point I would like to mention, uh, it is the freedom of use of outer space, one of the key principles also in the Outer Space Treaty. And this means that there is the freedom for the exploration and use of outer space by all states. And this means also that all actors have the equal rights to use space in the way they deem it useful and necessary. Now, there has been, and I have also read in some uh, newspapers or, or uh, articles, that um, people say um, small satellites or nanosatellites or CubeSats, they are just space debris, uh, and uh, we should do something against that. I hope I haven't read that in space news, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that uh, there is this opinion. No, that's wrong. That's simply wrong. Everybody has the right to use outer space in the way they deem it necessary. Of course, with a few caveats, but this basic principle should also encourage all of you who are part of the small SAT, nano SAT, cube SAT, space community, that you can be confident and don't have to be afraid of anything. The law is on your side. This is, this is very important uh, also for the public discourse. You can go into this public discourse with a lot of confidence based on international law. However, as I said, there are a few points uh, which, which limit that, which also show that there is other things behind, for example, that space activities shall be carried out for the benefit and in the interest of all states, including and taking into particular account the needs of developing countries. Um, we do not have that um, very visible and very clear in all space activities, but I think also, the activities conducted by space agencies show that there is this idea and this thinking behind a lot of space activities, and it is manifested also in activities of the ITU, even in its structure and in its rulemaking. Then I should mention also one other point, which is absolutely relevant and of utmost importance. One of the key principles of space law, and this is that space is not subject to national appropriation. We don't have to talk about the resources on the moon or on comets uh, here at this conference. It also is part of it. We have to talk and we have to consider that space resources can also be orbits or points like the Lagrange points. And this means that when you regard this as a resource, then it is absolutely forbidden to appropriate it. You can use it, but there is no national appropriation. And this also means companies, which are not nations, also cannot appropriate outer space resources. So these are a few principles which show and demonstrate the freedom of use of outer space. Then, we have on the other side the encouragement of international cooperation. Also there we have a number of principles, key principles which are enshrined in the Outer Space Treaty and other documents. One is uh, that space uh, shall contribute to maintaining international peace and promoting international cooperation. If I look into the round, I don't see many dangerous faces uh, who might uh, endanger international peace. But always keep in mind that this principle is also one of the key cornerstones of outer space law. And then we turn again to this issue which is closely related to the resources and to the management of the resources. It is that equitable access to these limited natural resources in particular in space has to be guaranteed 
as it is pointed out, not only in outer space law proper, but also in the founding or constituting documents of the ITU. As a last point, I'm mentioning here, and this is more a look uh, into the future, uh, a perspective also for space law making, that we are now looking more and more into the question of how to shape the behavior in outer space. So far, we have more or less dealt with in space law making with the status of outer space and with the status of the actors in outer space, which are primarily the nation states, and then uh, on the next level, the non-state actors. But now, during the past five or 10 years, we have started to look at regulation from the perspective of how to shape the behavior of actors in outer space, how to notify what you are doing when you do a maneuver, for example, how to register, how to possibly uh, um, make a notice when you are getting closer to other space actors, to another satellite. The behavior you are as a user of outer space have to uh, regard and have to take care in a way that others are not impeded by your activities in particular. So this is something, uh, the behavior in outer space, which, which has so far not been in the center of space lawmaking, but we are getting to that, for example, through the discussion of the code of conduct, uh, which was uh, proposed by the European Union. It's also about uh, transparency and confidence building measures by the uh, governmental group of experts, uh, which was established by the Secretary General uh, of the United Nations. So these are points which might also ultimately lead to the issue of space traffic management as one um, idea which could replace the current order for outer space and replace it with a traffic regime in outer space. This is far in the future, but, but it is something which is a trend uh, and which is certainly relevant uh, also and uh, already today when we ask ourselves how can we um, regulate the behavior in outer space and not only the status. Now this leads me to the very last point I want to mention, and this is the requirements for the responsible use of outer space, and I refer again to the title of my presentation, which is sustainable development or the sustainable use of outer space. And you see here uh, the bullet points I uh, put down here, that there are basically three elements of uh, requirements, which are also three elements of regulation. The first certainly is that since states are responsible and liable for space activities, be they governmental, be they non-governmental, they have to take care that there is an orderly conduct of space activities, not only by their governmental entities, but also by their private actors. And this means that they have to assure that through national space legislation, which comprises the authorization of non-state actors. And this is hyper important, I would say, for you also. When you are an academic institution, um, then you are in some countries in a gray zone. Are you a governmental actor? Are you a private actor? Are you authorized, are you licensed to conduct a space activity? Who is liable, your university or the state? This is why a number of countries, Austria for example, have passed such national legislation before they send up their first uh, university satellite. And others should take this as an example, and, and Professor Kudelka uh, will provide you with a first-hand experience on that. So first point is national uh, space legislation. 
Second point is debris mitigation. I don't have to tell you anything about the, uh, uh, about the space debris environment. It's growing, it's getting more and more dense, it's getting more and more dangerous also. So we have already started to regulate the debris mitigation. Uh, and uh, I might also um, foresee that in the future, we also will have to deal with the question of debris removal. Because even with a zero uh, emission of debris uh, from now on, we will face severe problems, great risks also through big objects in particular who might explode or might be hit. Uh, that we really have to think of space debris removal and maybe in the very distant future uh, there might be also um, a kind of uh, regime provisions for the removal which might be funded by the international community, uh, a regime for the removal of such objects. Last point, spectrum utilization. This will be the theme uh, for the next uh, two and a half days. I don't have to enter into that. Uh, you will hear uh, very important uh, presentations. It is uh, also, uh, I think, extremely timely that uh, this workshop and symposium is conducted now in view of the WRC, where uh, certainly there will be um, guiding uh, decisions in that field. And uh, I think that uh, ITU is very well prepared. ITU, the executive of ITU, has, a, has an excellent understanding uh, of the issue. And together with the community, I think the right, um, let's say, decisions and, and also discussions uh, can be conducted uh, at that conference. So this is what I wanted to uh, introduce to you. It is that the sustainable use of outer space, also including, and since we are here on, for that conference, for small satellite system, uh, comprises these elements, the freedom of use, the encouragement of international cooperation, and then this, this trias of uh, regulatory elements, which is national legislation, debris mitigation, and spectrum utilization, so that uh, this possibly can guide you also in structuring uh, the issue area and to better understand where to put uh, which element in. With this, I, I thank you again for, your, uh, for, for the invitation uh, to speak here, and I wish you a successful conference for the next two and a half days. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schreiber. The official part of uh, opening this session is over, and now there is a break ahead of us. We are slightly behind the schedule. I would like to ask you to shorten it from 20 originally planned minutes to 15, and uh, enjoy enjoy the uh, what's prepared out of this hall for you, and meet you in uh, 15 minutes here again. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for roasting the headlines. <laughs> no, no, no. That was uh, really excellent. And I think that was really, really good. Thanks a lot.